This video is the fifth installment of a seven-part retrospective looking back on BBC Sherlock and TJLC. It's intended that you watch the entire series in order. There's an annotation in the top right to the playlist for A Better Story, so you can start at the beginning. Series 4 of BBC Sherlock. Here we are at last. This video is designed to be more of a light-hearted reintroduction to Series 4 than an analysis of it. I will be pointing out some details that I plan to expand on in the final video of this retrospective, but I won't be speculating too much on what they might mean. In fact, most of the time, I'm not going to allude to them potentially meaning anything. So to the TJLC homies in the audience, you might want to brace yourself for a lot of me deliberately playing dumb. Here I'm just drawing your attention to the weirdness that seems to be an intrinsic part of the Series 4 experience. I'll also be calling back to a few moments in earlier episodes just to highlight how Series 4 doesn't keep to the show's internal logic. I think a lot of us built up these episodes into some unspeakable source of pain and horror. I know I did. But looking back on it, that might have been a bit of an overreaction. At worst, these are just three nonsensical episodes that seem to fly in the face of everything the show seemed to be about before this point. That doesn't have to retroactively ruin the rest of the story for you. And I think the best way to overcome that initial negative experience is to laugh at the absurdity of how things played out. Now, that being said, I have a dilemma there because I also want to write this, bearing in mind Mark and Stephen's perspective, the hurtable gaze of the human beings, as Stephen called it. So if series four really was the story they wanted to tell at face value, an entire video making fun of their story seems a bit mean-spirited. Maybe the absurdity and the contradictions are there for a thematic purpose, but what if they aren't? What if this, as it stands, is a story they love and are proud of. I can't say with any degree of honesty that I would understand why, but I do think that they have every right to tell the story as they want to tell it. And if this is really what they wanted, they have gotten lucky enough to have the opportunity to tell the stories they want to tell. In that case, I would guess that they knew that this wouldn't be a popular direction for the show. There seems to be a degree of awareness of that throughout, but they told the story they wanted in spite of that. I can genuinely say I respect that. If this is everything that Mark and Steven dreamed of doing in a Holmes adaptation, you know what? Good for them. Laying it all out on the line. Absolutely going for their creative vision. That's commendable. But I still find this an oddly paced, oddly constructive narrative that completely contradicts what was being set up in the first 10 episodes. So I am going to talk about that and poke fun at it. But at the end of the day, I'm not doing it to take the writers as people down a peg. I don't have to like or get it. They wrote the story for themselves. I think that's clear regardless of their intentions. And in spite of the mixed feelings I have about the impact of that artistic vision, that is one of the things about them that I've come to admire the most. Not caring what other people think when you pour your heart into something, that's hard. <laughs> and they seem to have mastered it. So in the same way I look at the show's treatment of fan characters and see it as a sort of affectionate ribbing, I hope that it's clear that this video isn't coming from a malicious place. We're still here to have fun and rediscover the joy in something we used to love, even in this most difficult chapter. The easiest way to do that is to laugh and to make it into a fun game. And in the interests of keeping things light and silly, I'd like to introduce you all to my friend, the Big Bopper. <laughs> yes, I did buy this just for this video. I know it's ridiculous, that's the point. When I come to a moment I want to criticize, I will give the moment a bop and we can all move on. <laughs> and hopefully the silliness of me with this giant inflatable mallet that says the big bopper in bubble font will remind everyone that we're having fun and that it's not worth getting actually upset about any of this, even if this is all there is to the story. Again, at worst, these are silly choices that don't gel with what they had laid out up to this point. Me and the big bopper are here to help you find fun even in that. Without further ado, Sherlock series four. Series 4 is weird. <laughs> to summarize my thoughts at the end of the last video, this series is sort of like the writers plucked at the loose threads present in the story, and instead of tying them neatly together, pulled and pulled until the entire narrative unraveled. Some of the ways that Series 4 is bad are things that have been present all along, dialed all the way up. The refusal to answer any questions the writers have presented, the way women are written, the unnecessarily queer villains, even the contradictions we've spoken about so much, are taken to such an extreme 
dream that it's hard to keep track of what's even happening or how you're meant to be feeling from moment to moment. I think that's why the most common reaction to series four is to say, oh, this story is just bad and always has been, because people recognize those weaknesses have always been there. And in many ways, I think that's a perfectly logical conclusion to come to. But there are things that are strange about series four that feel much more deliberate, and those are the choices that give me pause. Instead of pointing out those things as I run through the story, I thought it would be best to talk about each episode's unique flavor of peculiarity, because in some ways, they sort of frame everything else that happens in the episode. I'll start with the thing that's easiest to recognize as being intentionally odd in series four. This is 221B as you have known it. Not all of it, but definitely the most recognizable angle, right? Whomst among us has not had this wallpaper as a phone or desktop background at some point. In series four, our faithful blue skull painting has been replaced with this nightmarish creation that has the ability to glow. And glow she does at different intensities at different points. Sometimes she's a dim gray, sometimes she's bright blue. Hidden within the eyes of this skull are the eyes of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself, watching these events unfold like the eyes of God in The Great Gatsby. The writers, of course, have insisted that this painting doesn't glow at all. What's going on with her? I call her Yorick after Yorick the Fool from Hamlet. And while she is very odd, she did absolutely nothing wrong and shall not be receiving any bops. She's just doing her best. She's not the only thing weird in the set. The layout of John and Mary's flat has also changed, as you can see in some of these comparison shots. John and Mary also now sleep on opposite sides of the bed than they did in his last vow, which is such a small detail that I wouldn't really draw attention to it. If the scene of them in bed didn't open with a shot of them in the mirror, where they appear to be on the correct sides, which is a natural segue to the next bit of strangeness unique to the six Thatchers, since you might have caught a glimpse of it there the transitions. <laughs> BBC Sherlock has had its share of strange transitions in the past, especially in Mark episodes. It's worse than ever in The Six Thatchers. There are two weird transition styles this episode uses. Smashing bus. Something's going on. And water effects, both of which tie into other weird elements of the episode. Let's start with the bus. As you might recall, before series four, Sherlock and John had already solved the case of the six Thatchers around the time of that Christmas party in a scandal in Belgravia. You can even see the write-up for the case on screen in that episode. It's the one Sherlock points out that has the blog counter stuck at 1895, when they're 1895 locked. The count on your blog is still stuck at 1895. Uh, yes, yeah, faulty. Can't seem to fix it. Faulty. Or you've been hacked and it's a message. It's faulty, or you've been hacked and someone's sending you a message. It's just faulty. Oh, okay, Sherlock said it's just faulty. That's what we're going with. For now. Anyway, if you went into this episode hoping that the story might revisit that case and reveal something new, maybe something to do with the improbable one or Moriarty's involvement or, you know, both, you're going to be disappointed. Not only does this episode have nothing to do with that original Six Thatchers case, it's never acknowledged that the old case exists. So, you know, maybe the lesson here is you were never meant to pay attention to little details like supplementary materials or what is being shown on screen. Maybe they just want you to forget all about the blog, except they keep drawing attention to it. <laughs> Take all the credit. It gets boring if I just solve them all. Yeah, you say that, and then John blogs about it, and you get all the credit anyway. Yeah, he's got a point. Congratulations, by the way. Sorry? Well, you're about to solve a big one. Yeah, until John publishes his blog. Yeah, till then, basically. The worst, by far, is this scene at the start of the episode, when John writes the world's fakest-looking blog post in the background. Like, look at this. This is a photograph. The words johnsblog.jpg are shown on screen, and he's clearly pretending to type, like, what is this? The post he's writing also mentions that John is going to be a father in future tense, and that makes sense, Mary is pregnant in this scene, but then refers to the baby as if it's already alive, and he complains about having to constantly change nappies, which does not add up. So everything going on with John's blog in this episode warrants my very first bop. <laughs> bop. <laughs> then we get the water transitions, which are sometimes accompanied with 
literal sharks floating across the screen in an episode that is markedly worse than any that came before it. At least no one literally jumps over one of them. The water stuff is tricky because I can't actually get that deep into it without analyzing. So let's keep it to the context of this episode, which opens and closes with the story, Appointment in Samara. The story goes as follows. There's a merchant who is going about his business when he sees the grim figure of death. Panicked, he flees to another city, Samara, hoping to escape his fate. But death finds him there that night. The man asks why death seems surprised to see him earlier that day at the market, and death replies that he was expecting to find him that night in Samara. So in trying to avoid his destiny, the man only brought it about. This story is related to Mary more than once. There's this idea that she's trying to outrun her past and fighting a losing battle. But some of the references to this story seem to broaden the scope of it beyond her character. Particularly when Sherlock sees a bust of Thatcher and the water effects take over the screen and the very final scene, which ends like this. When does the path we walk on lock around our feet? When does the road become a river with only one destination? Death waits for us all in Samara, but can Samara be avoided? Bookending the episode with this story kind of blatantly places this as the central question of the episode. Can Samara be avoided? Which is an odd question to bring up because Sherlock has never really been a story about fate. Except you already know that for one scene, it was. A scene that seemed to declare that avoiding fate was actually the point of the story all along. This is how we end, you and I. Always here. Always together. <coughs> and that scene will later be tied into the water effects with a completely different, much less interesting explanation. Like I've already said, this series completely abandons the plot with Moriarty and Mary and Mycroft and everything else even a little bit interesting that they had set up. But watching these episodes, it feels at points like the writers are very aware of that, the potential that they've abandoned, and are repeatedly reminding you of the story that you aren't getting. Now maybe that's a cruel jab at fan theories, just like in The Empty Hearse, or maybe, like the literal empty hearse of that episode, the reminders are intentional. Because there is one last element that ties all of this together. A conversation between Mycroft and Sherlock about the story Appointment in Samara. Mycroft reveals that, as a child, Sherlock rewrote the story. Appointment in Samara. You always hated that story as a child. Less keen on predestination back then. You wrote your own version, as I remember. Appointment in Sumatra. The merchant goes to a different city and is perfectly fine. Appointment in Sumatra? Hang on, hang on, Sumatra Road. You mentioned Sumatra Road, Mr. Holmes. There was a station down there. Well, why was it on the maps? Because it was closed before it ever opened. What? Sorry. <laughs> the happy ending is in a train car with the heart-shaped bomb that never went off? And that's how the story can avoid its fate? Hey everybody, editing Rebecca here with Belle this time. I just wanted to include a bit of the canon context for this. The references to both rats and Sumatra in the episode The Empty Hearse are a reference to the story The Sussex Vampire, where we get a brief reference to the ship Matilda Briggs and its association with the Great Rat of Sumatra, which is, and I quote, a story for which the world is not yet prepared. A paragraph which also mentions Grimm's fairy tales. There's also another reference to this moment on John's blog, the Tilly Briggs Cruise of Terror, an entry which had to be taken down because the ship's owners launched an appeal. Just thought you might want to know that context. I realized that this conversation has veered dangerously close to analysis when I promised you that I wouldn't do that, so... Sorry. See, it does have multiple uses, <laughs> but that's the context in which The Six Thatchers takes place. Abandoned plot lines and blog posts that don't matter anymore and discussions of fate and how to avoid it. Oh, and of course, how could I forget the way the episode begins with discussions of doctored footage and the official version of a story that isn't the true one. That's not what happened at all. It is now. If James Moriarty can hack every TV screen in the land, rest assured we have the tech to doctor a bit of security footage. That is now the official version. Moriarty hacking every TV screen in the land maybe should have been more of a red flag for what we were in for, in hindsight. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> On to the episode. On 
on top of everything else. Series 4 also has a bit of a pacing problem. It's very unclear when things take place, and this episode in particular flies by at a manic rate for the first 10 minutes before slowing to a crawl for the remaining 80. The first scene immediately does a 180 on Sherlock knowing what Moriarty is going to do next. At least we get a warning of what we're in for. Let's plan something, something long term, something that would take effect if you never made it off that rooftop alive. Posthumous revenge. No, better than that. Posthumous game. The supply of game is steadily increasing, and Moriarty is playing from beyond the grave. Sherlock's plan, as John nicely explains for us, is just to solve a bunch of cases until something happens, and we get a frantic montage where Sherlock barely looks away from his phone. So you know how I said that it seems like the writers know the story you, and by you I do mean TJLC homies we're hoping for? Here's the first scene I was talking about. We see an on-screen mention of a deadly assassin lurking by, who later turned out to be... <laughs> a jellyfish. I know. You can't arrest the jellyfish. You could try. We did try. A conversation which is erupted by Mary going into labor and calling 59 times. 59 missed calls. Made a lot of trouble. <clears throat> If there be nothing new but that which hath been before, how are brains beguiled, which, laboring for invention, bear amiss the second burthen of a former child? Oh, that record could, with a backward look, even of five hundred courses of the sun, show me your image in some antique book, since mind at first in character was done, that I could see what the old world could say to this composed wonder of your frame, whether we are mended, or were better they, or whether revolution be the same. Oh, I am sure the wits of former days, to subject worse, have given admiring praise. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. It's a reflex. <laughs> but considering we go from that text to Mary calling, could Mary be the real assassin lurking nearby? It sure seems like they want you to get excited at the thought. <laughs> Before we move on, I want to point out that this brief exchange is the only time in the entire episode that Sherlock and John are alone together. I am not kidding. <laughs> so I hope you like people trying to arrest a jellyfish. That's all you're getting. If you're picking up on an inside joke there, you are correct. <laughs> Sherlock's frantic texting continues through labor, at the baby's homecoming, and at the baptism. Sherlock mentions that he's deleting all of John's texts. Didn't you get John's texts? No, I delete his texts. Delete any text that begins hi. This texting montage finally ends with John sitting on a bus and getting one last text from Sherlock, inviting him to a case. Before John leaves, he exchanges smiles with a pretty woman. but realizes when he gets off the bus that he has a private life flower stuck behind his ear. I can, I can just hear those malicious whispers behind my back. What am I to do? Well, for one thing, I'd get rid of that flower. I'm gonna finish this at night. The next case involves more doctored footage, the son making it look like he's in Tibet when really he's right outside the house. In the same scene, we get Mary on video call and both Sherlock and John talking more to her than to each other. Don't give it a title. People like the titles. Don't hate the titles. Give the people what they want. No, never do that. People are stupid. Uh, some people. All people are stupid. Most people. Sure enough, though, isn't it? This is the point where Sherlock discovers the first missing Thatcher bust, and he immediately makes the connection back to Moriarty. I have the strangest feeling. Miss me. Which is weird, because this goes nowhere. This case ends up only relating to Mary, not even to Eurus, who the show will later say is the reason for Sherlock's repressed water memories. So. Why the water? <laughs> Unless all of these things are related somehow, but because we aren't reading that deeply into anything right now, this doesn't add up, so bop. <laughs> Sherlock goes back to working on random cases and we get a joke about Sherlock not really needing John to actually be there. John? Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, listening. What is that? That is me. Well, it's a me substitute. Yeah, that's bop worthy. Bop. <laughs> Sherlock then begins deducing the client, and you'll want to brace yourself. The man's wife, you see, is a deadly spy, one of the most dangerous in the world, and only married him as part of an intricate plot all orchestrated by Moriarty. Anderson's theory music plays over this entire explanation, and the skull is glowing. <laughs> Greta Bengstotter, disguised as a 22 stone cleaner, will inject the president in the back of the neck with a dangerous new drug. This drug will then render the president entirely susceptible to the will of that new master, none other than James Moriarty. <gasps> Which is kind of a tip off for the bait and switch, because in terms of mirror characters, this is very promising. But alas, Sherlock made up the whole thing. Are you serious? No, of course not. His wife left him because his breath stinks and he likes to wear her lingerie. And the show seems to be mocking the underlying idea, Mary being Moran, 
just like it did to Anderson's theories. In broad strokes, Anderson is actually correct. Sherlock did survive, there was a body double, and Molly Hooper was in on the plan. It's only in the details where things start to get a bit off the rails. Shh, not now! Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I had that coming. <laughs> Sherlock leads John to the house of an acquaintance who owns a dog, and they find Mary there, invited by Sherlock. She tries to send John home with Rosie, and we get what is, in my mind, maybe the second worst exchange on the show. Mary, what are you doing here? She's better at this than you. Better? So I texted her. Hang on, Mary's better than me. Well, she's a retired super agent with a terrifying skill set. Of course she's better. I'm sorry. Who is this? This is not Sherlock. He would not say that. Also, hadn't the writers both been going on and on about how vital John is to this story? But now Mary and Sherlock act like they're doing John a favor by letting him tag along. Well, so I'm supposed to just go home now, am I? Oh, what do you think, Sherlock? Should we take him with us? John on the dog. <laughs> That's funny. John. Well. He's handy and loyal. <laughs> That's hilarious. Hmm. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> At the very least, we get this line from John. Is it too early for a divorce? In fact, this is all reminding me of an earlier scene. Uh, look at you two. You should have got married. The stuff Magnuson had we never really get to see the Watsons being happy. As a nice bonus, because the dog was being uncooperative on the day of filming, we get this nice counterbalancing line from Sherlock. You just like this dog, don't you? I like you. Like, just when you're sure that the show is implying that Sherlock doesn't even like John, the contradictions are still at work, I see. The thief they're trying to track was one step ahead of them and hid his scent by walking through a pool of blood. Because everyone knows blood leads you to the truth. Sherlock goes on about how this can only be Moriarty. It's designed to beguile me, tease me, and lure me in. Lost. A noose for me to put my neck into. So even from beyond the grave, Moriarty's plan is to flirt with Sherlock using cases? At least it's consistent, I guess, but I'm giving this a bop for reminding me of a much more interesting villain hero dynamic without actually delivering on it. <laughs> bop. <laughs> Sherlock eventually stakes out the location of the sixth and final Thatcher bust alone, without either John or Mary. The thief, who we later learn is a man named AJ, shows up and the two fight. AJ smashes Sherlock through a pane of glass and the two wrestle in water for a while before Sherlock eventually makes it back to the bust. Sherlock is still under the impression that this all ties back to Moriarty, but AJ says Sherlock knows nothing. This subversion is kind of an encapsulation of everything that's happening in series four. You were expecting Moriarty, you get the same thing Sherlock does. Sherlock smashes the bust and reveals... The problems of your past are your business. The problems of your future are my privilege. Okay, I have to say that I love that this is the moment we flash back to for the flash drive and that John's reconciliation speech about the problems of Mary's future being his privilege has this horror lighting and music playing over it. 10 out of 10 best moment of the episode. I would remove one bop for how much I enjoy this, but immediately after this, Sherlock says something about Mary destroying the memory stick. She, she destroyed it. She. Even though we just saw John doing it, which is a blatant contradiction. So since we aren't reading into that, we'll just call it even. AJ quickly picks up on the fact that Sherlock knows Mary and is furious. You know her. You do, don't you? You know the bitch. Immediately after that problems of your future line. So this finally appears to be something from Mary's past actually coming back to haunt her. Someone wants revenge for something Mary did. Something relating to that flash drive. Who are you? I'm the man who's gonna kill your friend. AJ. AJ. Wonder if there are any AJs in canon. Oh! There is a J.A. in The Adventure of the Gloria Scott. There was even a reference to that scene earlier in this episode. You said I had an ex. You've got a Japanese tattoo in the crook of your elbow in the name of Kako. It's obvious you've tried to have it removed. The line, the supply of game is steadily increasing, also from Gloria Scott. <laughs> so J.A.? A.J. It almost looks like they took the name and mirrored it. Oh, oh, I get it. AJ's a John mirror. Yeah, sorry. You know how I am about mirrors. We get a flashback to Agra's final mission, a group of four agents. The scene opens with hostages playing chess and talking about something or someone named Ammo. I've got Ammo. Ammo? Agra comes in to save them, because apparently they're the good guys now. I could bring up Magnuson and how he seemed to imply that Mary was a villain. And I will. <laughs> oh, she's bad, that one. So many dead people. She's gone a bit freelance now. Bad girl. 
Oh, she's so wicked. So, uh, nice rewriting of history there. Bop. <laughs> the mission goes wrong. Mary and AJ are trapped. Except Mary made it out. And so did AJ, although he was kidnapped and tortured, along with Alexander, another member of the group. His captors mock him when they think he's lost consciousness. What would he do if he knew, huh, about the English woman? What would you do to a traitor? We see AJ in the present day in a miserable looking empty flat, drinking until he passes out and looking up Sherlock Holmes. What is that reminding me of? I'm just saying if he was a John Muir, no, you're right, I'm sorry, I'll stop. Sherlock confronts Mary in some sort of crypt lair that is giving me serious flashbacks to that scene at the end of Tab. Mary seems uneasy. That was quite a text you sent me. What's going on, Sherlock? Yeah, Sherlock, what is going on? I was so convinced it was Moriarty, I couldn't see what was right under my nose. So it's not just moments making fun of the idea that Mary might be an accomplice to Moriarty. Some are just, blatantly teasing the idea play dead straight. It still doesn't actually go anywhere though, and this is very frustrating, so bop. They talk about the memory stick. Sherlock tells Mary AJ wants to kill her now. Mary gets upset and Sherlock reminds her of his promise to keep her safe. I made a vow, remember? To look after the three of you. Sherlock the Dragon Slayer. <sighs> dragon Slayer. How brave he was and how many dragons he'd slain. The Dragon Slayer. Is that what you think of me? No, it's what you think of yourself. I would love it if the writers stopped reminding me of the show I would much rather be watching if they want me to get through this one. <laughs> Bob. Mary then drugs Sherlock and runs, and Sherlock has a flashback to his childhood. Because something about getting drugged by Mary reminds him of Eurus? Don't think about it too hard. <laughs> Bob. Sherlock confronts Mycroft about his awareness of Agra, which is when we get this delightful line. Agra is an acronym. Oh good, I love an acronym. All the best secret societies have them. I don't know if the worst thing about that is the way the camera cuts to a close-up, but still leaves the pen Mark is holding in frame, or this smug smile on his face, or the way secret societies tie back to the brides at the heart of the conspiracy. All of the above? Let's go all of the above. Bop! <laughs> Mycroft initially pretends he doesn't know who Agra was, but drops the act pretty quickly. Team of agents, the best, but you know all that. Of course I do, come on. One of them, AJ, is looking for Mary, also one of the team. Indeed. Well, that's news to me. Is it? Which I guess addresses part of the plot hole of Mycroft not knowing who Mary was, but also implies that he was just cool with her shooting Sherlock, I guess? It still doesn't quite add up. But I'm willing to let it go until he reveals that he was the one to end the contract with Agra. My initiative. Freelancers are too woolly, too messy. I don't like loose ends. Not on my watch. Mark? <laughs> Bob. Mycroft warns Sherlock that he's putting off the inevitable. Mary is going to die regardless, but Sherlock seems set on keeping her alive. We then cut to John reading Mary's farewell letter, which sounds nothing at all like her, while hijinks ensue on a plane. But did somebody hide the sun? Did you lose it in the war? <laughs> She also implies that Sherlock and John would only slow her down, like she's the main character now. But I don't want you and Sherlock hanging off my gun arm. I'm sorry, my love. Okay, sure. <laughs> Eventually, Sherlock finds her. He initially offers some nonsense answer about being able to predict her movements before revealing that he just tracked the memory stick, which wasn't even his plan. Feasible variables. Yes, I started to run out about then. In the memory stick. <laughs> yeah, that was my idea. So there has been at least one scene of John and Sherlock meeting in secret to discuss Mary and planning how to outmaneuver her that we haven't gotten to see. John and Mary talk about her secrets and he reveals that she might not be the only one hiding things. Yes. You said it was your initials. In a way that was true. In a way. So many lies. I'm so sorry. I don't just mean you. He works out by process of elimination that she's R. Rosamund Mary. I always liked Mary. Yeah, me too. I used to. Am I supposed to be rooting for them as a couple or not? Like, seriously, you thought this show was giving you whiplash before. We also get this rather fascinating callback. If you were anywhere near this kind of thing again, you could have called, you could have talked to me. I, I didn't know what else to do. You could have stayed, you could have talked to me. That's what couples are supposed to do. Work things through. 
And the conversation inexplicably ends with Mary saying she just wanted to keep John and Rosie safe, and Sherlock seemingly picking up the train of thought. Like, watch this, it feels like he's finishing her sentence. I don't deserve you. I, all I ever wanted to do was keep you and Rosie safe, that's all. I will keep you safe. Which is just weird. <laughs> if you aren't reading anything into it, that is. Which we aren't. We aren't. <laughs> This happy moment is interrupted by AJ, who had tracked Sherlock to find Mary. After a tense standoff, where everyone is behind cover, a train passes by, and Mary and AJ confront one another. You know I'll kill you too. You know I will, AJ. But you think I care if I die? I've dreamed of killing you, squeezing the life out of your treacherous lying throat. I swear to you, AJ. Sherlock tries to point out to AJ that he never actually heard Mary's name, but it doesn't matter. The police come in and AJ is killed. The trio returns to England and we get to see what John was referring to when he said that he was also lying. John, it turns out, has been having an affair. Nice eyes. Look, <laughs> Thank you. Look, I don't normally do this, but um... But you're gonna? Yeah. We cut back to the happiest domestic scene we ever see for John and Mary, which for the record, is them bickering over whether their daughter is the devil or the antichrist, and see that even then, John was busy flirting with someone else. Talk about mixed messages, huh? Are they happy together and Mary is a good person, or are they miserable and Mary is still a villain? Apparently the answer is that Mary is good, but John is a terrible person. You don't make it easy, do you? What do you mean? <clears throat> Being so perfect. This scene also raises some timeline questions. How long was Mary on the run? And how long was John gone? And if John and Sherlock were chasing Mary around the world, who was watching the baby? The answer? Pop! Don't think about it too hard. The one and only time the baby matters is in this exchange. Can you tell me later? Yeah. Well, no, we can't just go. Rosie. Well, we should both stay and wait for her. I mean, you know that's not gonna happen. If there's more to this case, you're the one who needs to see it. Yeah, okay, you win. Literally, this is the only time that Rosie is a realistic concern. Why did they introduce this baby to the plot when she might as well not exist most of the time? Is it just so John can be late to this scene? I think it might just be so that John can be late to this scene. Sherlock and Mary confront the real ammo in an aquarium. And boy, these jellyfish in the background are reminding me of something. <laughs> a jellyfish? I know. You can't arrest the jellyfish. Oh yeah, the one and only John and Sherlock scene in the entire episode. That's a weird coincidence. We see John calling either Lestrade or Mycroft from the cab, who both somehow beat him to the aquarium in spite of his head start. As they arrive, Norbury decides to get one last bit of revenge. Apologies in advance if you like this scene. I know some people do, but I cannot take it seriously. What just happened blatantly contradicts the show's own rules about gunshots. It's not like it is in the movies. There's not a great big spurt of blood and you go flying backwards. That was two episodes ago, for the record. <laughs> Likewise, while Sherlock only retained consciousness for a few seconds... It's all well and clever having a mind palace, but you've only three seconds of consciousness left to use it. Mary has enough time to give a moving speech about how much she loved John. John, I think this is it. No, 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 it's not. You gave me everything I could ever, ever <laughs> want. Mary? <laughs> how much she likes Sherlock. Hey, Sherlock, I like you. Did I ever say? Including this just amazing line. I'm sorry for, for shooting you that time. I'm really sorry. I love that comedy gold, but that might not be what this scene is going for. She's also quick to say that what she did to Sherlock doesn't actually matter after this. I think we're even now, okay? Okay. And with her dying breath, Mary declares that her only purpose in life was to be married to John. Being Mary Watson was the only life worth living. Thank you. Okay. And then we get just the most reaction from John. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry if you like this scene. I'm not trying to ruin your enjoyment. Just explaining why it doesn't work for me. Because we found out John had been cheating on Mary 
not even 10 minutes ago, and we've seen them do nothing but bicker and hide things and joke about getting a divorce. This depth of devotion between them is coming out of nowhere. And we've seen John grieve before, and it looked nothing like this. Please, let me just... Sherlock tries to comfort John, who immediately puts the blame on him. You made a vow. You swore me. Which is another moment that feels familiar somehow. You promised to keep him safe. You promised. And then the absolute clincher is that without Mary, everything falls apart. Like she needed to be there for John and Sherlock to function individually or have a relationship with each other. John holes up in his house, ignoring calls from Sherlock. Sherlock goes to therapy to learn how to help John. But he eventually finds a DVD in the mail that looks like it's finally a message from Moriarty. I knew Moriarty made plans. Thought that would get your attention. Pop. Of course not. <laughs> Mary recorded a message before her death because she knew Sherlock and John would fall apart without her. Sherlock tries to visit John and is turned away by Molly. It's, uh, it's from John. He said he'd, that he'd rather have anyone but you. Sherlock reads the letter from John, which we, the audience, never get to see. Why? <laughs> Pop. And the episode ends with Sherlock questioning if fate can be avoided. Well, apart from one final villain Mary tease in the post credits. Go to hell, Sherlock. So rounding out the episode, Bob. <laughs> The general consensus seems to be that The Lying Detective is the strongest episode of series four on a surface level. I agree with that assessment, but that doesn't mean the episode is without its share of strangeness. Some of these we've already talked about. Yorick is still being her odd, beautiful, glowing self. Most notably, in one scene she has been replaced entirely with a black frame that isn't even the same dimensions. There's just a black square hanging there now. So love that. John's blog continues to be mentioned more than usual. In this particular episode, no one but the villain seems to know it's even John's blog. They all think it's Sherlock's. Dr. Watson. I love his blog, don't you? His blog? I don't you read it. You mean my blog? I was just saying I love your blog. Great. It's thanks. my blog. Oh my god, I love your blog. You're welcome. The most infuriating reference to the blog, though, even worse than the fact that they blatantly ignored the Six Thatcher's entry, hands down, this line. You write Sherlock's blog? Yes. It's gone downhill a bit, isn't it? No, it's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. Keep it light. Um, yeah, it has, hasn't it? <laughs> How funny you should say so, Stephen. <sighs> the weird transitions continue. Instead of smashing and water effects, this time it's footage of Culverton Smith getting spliced in at random intervals. <laughs> I'm Culverton Smith. And this election year, I'll be voting. Even when I'm on the road, I still like quality food. My favorite, and by favorite, I do mean the one that makes me want to bop something, has to be this one. Mostly we're tracking his phone. Don't call us, we'll call- I'm trying to sleep, can you stop ringing my damn phone? Can you please stop talking about phones? Thank you, Bob. And while we're on the topic of TJLC symbols. Yes, but I'm very busy at the moment. I have to drink a cup of tea. This cup of tea, Code. It's a cup of tea. Because you might prefer some coffee. That is just straight up drink code. Cool. Remember the Tumblr Q&A response Stephen gave where he said that he prefers coffee, Mark handles the tea? It seems like there's about a 0% chance that he doesn't know what he's doing here. And so I feel obligated to point out that Sherlock never actually drinks any coffee. And in fact, asks Mrs. Hudson for tea a few minutes later. Oh, hello. Can I have a cup of tea? And we get a slow motion close up of tea spilling. So Sherlock is gay. Yeah, you're right. I had that coming. <laughs> there are a couple more odd things, but I think it makes more sense to address those as they come up. We also have another book ending device in this episode, like Samara last time. This time, the episode begins and ends with a gunshot. The exact same footage of a gunshot, in fact. At the beginning, John is presumably at home alone, except we see pretty quickly he's not. So there is no one you talk to, confide. No one. Are you going to tell her about me? No, so I can't. 
Why not? Because I can't, you know I can't. She thinks you're dead. Villain Mary reveal time? No, of course not. This isn't real. John, you've got to remember it's important. I am dead. This isn't real. I'm dead. They are sure going to remind you of that potential though. Bob. We cut back in time to Culverton Smith, staring at his own reflection. The meeting begins and Culverton Smith starts talking about how he has secrets he's holding back, keeping from everyone close to him. What's the very worst thing you can do your very best friends? Tell them your darkest secret. Once you've opened your heart, you can't close it again. So, John Mirror? I, I can't help it, it's a reflex. I just want you guys to know that genuinely, like I could do this all day, this does not hurt, okay? We're not <laughs> actually, that's why I got the big bopper. Okay. We are then introduced to TD12, which specifically acts as a memory inhibitor. Culverton wants to confess without any repercussions, you see. I'm afraid that some of the memories you've had up to this point might also be corrupted. Okay, look, I'm sorry, I'm doing it in advance, but the last episode started with doctored footage and the official version that was a lie, and this one starts with John seeing things that aren't there, a drug that affects memory, and the idea that the things that have happened up to this point have been corrupted. There's a boring explanation for that. This could all be foreshadowing Sherlock's own repressed memories, but with the doctored footage in particular and the use of the word corrupted? You once called your brain a hard drive. Well, say hello to the virus. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> I'll stop. Culverton starts explaining his whole deal. There are charities that I support who wouldn't exist without me. If life is a balance sheet, and I think it is, well, I believe I'm in credit. Why does that sound so familiar? <laughs> Billy Kincaid, the Camden Garata, best man ever, knew vast contributions to charity never disclosed. Personally managed to save three hospitals from closure and run the best and safest children's homes in North England. Yes, every now and again there'd be some garrottings, but stacking up the life saved against the garrottings on balance, I'd say. Yes, the villain of this episode is a joke from an earlier episode, played dead straight for 90 minutes. Pop. <laughs> Culverton's daughter, Faith, is trying desperately to write down everything she can remember before it's too late. But Culverton comes in and takes the note. That's when we cut forward to Faith in the present, talking to Sherlock about the case. She looks a bit different. Do you ever look in the mirror and want to see someone else? I would love it if you guys would stop talking about mirrors. I'm trying not to get bopped over here. Sherlock is in a full relapse, worse than the one in his last vow, and is barely coherent during this conversation. He initially turns her down, but changes his mind. Your life is not your own. Keep your hands off it. Do you hear me? You said I was your last hope, and now you're going out into the night with no plan on how you're getting home and a gun. Okay, you might be thinking that I owe you a self-bop for pointing out the mirror, but I didn't put that flashback in there. That was in the episode. Faith is explicitly a John mirror. The show makes sure to point it out. So mirroring is a thing on this show then? But then what about... Well, it's a me substitute. Have you ever wondered if your wife was a little bit out of your league? Every day as they tore into me, I'm a... I'm a... Um, and that probably accounts for the drink problem too, there's like tremor in your hand. I have a need to confess, but you, I think, might have a need to forget. Do I bop myself or do I bop the show for this? I honestly don't know, I'm just gonna put the mallet down for now. Let's talk more about Faith, who, in addition to having a cane and a gun and being suicidal, also lives in a tiny ground floor apartment and was in a relationship with a partner who she wasn't having sex with, evidenced by the fact that she was hurting herself and her partner didn't notice. How do you know he didn't notice? Oh, well, because you would have done something about it. Faith remarks on Sherlock's sentimental logic here. Well, that's interesting. What is? The way you think. Superbly. Sweetly. I'm not sweet, I'm just high. Now that the show has pointed out that Faith is a John Mirror, I'm sort of left wondering what I'm meant to do with that information. Nothing, nothing for now, I guess. Their exchange ends with Sherlock having another flashback to his childhood. At least this one makes a bit more sense, considering he was just talking to his sister. When he comes around, he realizes that the name Faith couldn't remember wasn't a name at all. Her father didn't want to kill one person, he wanted to kill... Anyone. Sherlock more or less has a total breakdown at this point. He collapses and we skip forward three weeks. Mrs. Hudson asks John to examine Sherlock, Ghost Mary egging him on in the background. Of course, she's the glue holding them together, but John refuses. Mrs. Hudson breaks down in tears. Have you spoken to Mycroft, uh, Molly, anyone? 
they don't matter, you do. And John begrudgingly agrees to come see Sherlock, who Mrs. Hudson reveals is handcuffed in the boot of her car. Sherlock has apparently been fixated on Culverton for weeks now. He's practically turned 221B into a shrine to him, which don't mention mirrors, don't mention mirrors. He's apparently escalated to calling out Culverton Smith on Twitter. And Culverton reaches out to John, apparently under the impression that they have a meeting scheduled. I've sent a car, I should be outside. Mr. Holmes gave me an address. Well, he couldn't have given you this one. So two weeks ago, two weeks, you knew exactly where you'd need to be picked up for lunch? The fact that Sherlock has perfectly predicted the actions of everyone around him weeks in advance while he's this out of it is the second most ridiculous thing about this episode. Gonna go ahead and give it a bop. Pop. <laughs> but he did it to prove a point because he needs John's help, specifically dealing with Culverton. I've still got it. So when I tell you that this is the most dangerous, the most despicable human being that I have ever encountered, when I tell you that this, this monster must be ended. That's funny because I thought when you stacked up the lives saved against the smotherings, <laughs> yeah. Bop. John is convinced Sherlock is just trying to trick him. Sherlock asks why he would think that. Yeah, well, they're real enough. I you lie all the time. It's like your mission. I have been many things, John, but when have I ever been a malingerer? You pretended to be dead for two years. Ah, okay, so this is still hanging over them. Cool. Would love to see that actually addressed. No, no, of course not. Bop. <laughs> we then get this awful line. Before I do anything, I need to know what state you're in. Well, you're a doctor. Examine me. No, I need a second opinion. I, 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 I hope you have misdiagnosed. Then correct me, doctor. Of the two, I actually think the one in this episode is worse. And by worse, I mean more painful. Mary turns up, again, already called by Sherlock weeks in advance, and Sherlock leaves with her. John and Ghost Mary have a chat about how Sherlock predicted where he would go, based on the type and time of therapy appointment he would make. And you are done with the world being explained to you by a man. <laughs> well, who isn't? Honestly, the audacity of Stephen Mossblain Moffat to write that line. Yeah, a bop. <laughs> the suggestion in this scene is that Ghost Mary is representing John's repressed emotions and is a manifestation of his own mind. I'm in your head, John. You're disagreeing with yourself. So if that's true, what do I make of this? He is the cleverest man in the world, but he's not a monster. Yeah, he is. Yeah, okay, all right, he is. Uh, <laughs> but he's our monster. Calling your best friend your monster in your head. Okay, you know what? This is actually an improvement from an episode where they barely spoke. I will welcome this, even if it is just baiting. The bait is delicious. John meets Sherlock and Molly, who reveals Sherlock is a few weeks away from dying at the rate he's going. So this is real? Well, you've really lost it. You're actually out of control. When have I ever been that? Since the day I met you? Oh, clever boy. I missed you fumbling around the place. Clever boy? Okay, be careful what you wish for, I guess. John asks what's going on, and Sherlock refuses to tell him. I thought this was some kind of- what? trick. Of course it's not a trick, it's a plan. What plan? I'm not telling you. Why not? Because you won't like it. No, it's fine. We're fine. I'm fine. <laughs> we then find out that Culverton is using the entire thing as a publicity stunt. He's openly admitting to being a serial killer. Has it occurred to you anywhere in your drug-addled brain that you've just been played for an ad campaign? Brilliant, isn't it? Safest place to hide. Plain sight. Okay, if I just put the geek interpreter case on screen again and don't say anything about it, that doesn't count as analysis, right? I'm just showing you something that this scene reminds me of for no particular reason. <laughs> no bobs necessary. As they leave, Culverton comes by and asks what Sherlock thought of the ad. It's funny because it's true. At the hospital, Sherlock entertains a group of children with an explanation of how he works. The main feature of interest in the field of criminal investigation is not the sensational aspects of the crime itself, but rather the iron chain of reasoning. That's the only truly remarkable aspect of the entire affair. Hang on, I recognize those phrases. But in all of this, there is only one element which can be said to be truly remarkable. There was one feature and only one feature of interest in the whole of this baffling case, and quite frankly, it was the usual. John Watson. Why do I get the feeling that John is being intentionally written out here? This scene is actually the closest to Sherlock and John's usual dynamic we get this series, with a bit of quippy back and forth, all the while Ghost Mary, aka John, smiles on at Sherlock's antics. God, I miss them so much. Please, please just bring them back. This series wouldn't be nearly as bad if it just had more of John and Sherlock actually being friends, but this and the moment with the jellyfish are 
basically it. <laughs> this brief happy moment is interrupted by Culverton asking about serial killings, making everyone in the room extremely uncomfortable. He declares that if you have enough power, you're untouchable. No one's untouchable. No one. Culverton leads Sherlock and John through the hospital, and we get another reference to confessions. Well, it's just a monthly top up. Confession is good for the soul. On the way out of this room, we get another reminder of the dropped Villain Mary and Moriarty plot lines. The game is on. Do you still miss me? Please stop reminding me of the show I would much rather be watching. Bop. <laughs> Culverton then leads them to his favorite room, the morgue. What do you think? Tough crowd. No, I've always found them quite pliable. Culverton starts talking about H.H. H. Holmes a real serial killer who set up a horror house at the Chicago fair in order to kill people. Culverton calls that stupid. If you want to hide a murder, if you want to hide lots and lots of murders. Just find a hospital. Okay, I'm giving myself another preemptive bop for drawing your attention to this next one, but please tell me that this shot is not as bonkers as the double mirror shot in Hounds. Can we be clear? Are you confessing? To what? The way you're talking. They look exactly the same. I hate this. Culverton begins mocking John for taking the idea seriously, though. His explanation? Delusional paranoia about a, a public personality. That's not so special. It's not even new. So far, I haven't shown you any interviews for series four, but with this scene, I have to show you this one. This idea of this sort of untouchable media personality. The way in which fame and popularity and uh, sort of self-mythologizing can make you kind of untouchable. This is a trap because if I make any sort of implication about that, I hate it. Bop. <laughs> Sherlock is seemingly unbothered by Culverton's denials because he thinks he has another witness coming, Faith Smith. Except Faith arrives and it turns out that Sherlock never met Faith at all. I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, but I don't think I've ever been anywhere near your flat. Sherlock begins spiraling and pulls a scalpel on Culverton. We cut forward to John in an interrogation cell. The conversation here makes it sound like Sherlock might have stabbed Culverton like he killed Magnuson. Not long ago, he shot Charles Magnuson in the face. We did see it coming. We always saw it coming, but it was fun. Was it? Was that fun? You and I remember his last vow very differently, John. <laughs> but we then find out Culverton is alive and well after all. What happened instead is a bit rough to watch. But if you're like me and you have developed a Pavlovian response to the word game... Is this a, a game? This is a bloody game! I don't know, John. Is it a game? You tell me. Sherlock insists that John be allowed to do what he likes in perhaps the saddest moment on the show. He's entitled. I killed his wife. Yes, you did. This is just heartbreaking. And like I mentioned in the last episode, the idea that John would choose Mary out of Sherlock is kind of coming out of nowhere. Like, you know what this entire plot line reminds me of most, actually? John, please. I'm not playing this time, Sherlock. Not anymore. When you're ready to go to work, give me a call. I'm taking Mary home. You're what? Mary's taking me home. Better. Yeah, exactly. And that was a nightmare. Of all the contradictions this show has pulled, Mary is the most confusing. Because if you were paying attention to the details in His Last Vow and The Abominable Bride, the emotional moments of this series aren't going to land for you because the two leads connection to her rings constantly false. And even if the moments land for you, the central idea here that Mary is the emotional core of this or any other Holmes adaptation is parodic. I think this is a big part of why people think series four ruined John, because when you make Mary the emotional center and a good person after all, but leave in the bits where he was still unhappy with her and introduce a cheating subplot and also have him so angry about her death that he assaults Sherlock, it makes him look like a horrible person. And as much baggage as John Watson had, he wasn't a horrible person before series four. This is crowned off with the fact that John apparently plans to leave Sherlock forever without another word, leaving his cane as a final goodbye. But then Mycroft calls and John internally berates himself for still obsessing over Sherlock. Still thinking about Sherlock? No, you are. A disapproving face on well, seeing as I'm inside your head, I think we can call that self-loathing. At Baker Street, Mycroft tries to figure out why Sherlock is falling apart. Something he says here reminds John of an earlier conversation, where Mycroft referenced not giving his other sibling special treatment, and John calls him out on it. I misspoke. He's lying. 
You're lying. Sherlock's not your only brother. A secret brother. What is he locked up in a tower or something? Not far off, actually. Though the phrasing here. <laughs> a secret brother. Maybe he was a secret twin. A what? A secret twin? Yeah, if you're gonna bring up the idea as a joke, you can't really expect it to land with any kind of weight later on. Mrs. Hudson comes up, and when she realizes what Mycroft is after, she laughs at him for missing the point. He's not about thinking. Not Sherlock. Of course he oh, is. Oh no, he's more emotional, isn't he? When I said last time that Sherlock's arc in series four survives more or less unscathed, this is what I meant. Like everyone else, Sherlock has several out of character moments and choices. But of the three questions that are really one question, Sherlock's is the only one that actually follows up on the answer that had been built up in the first 10 episodes. Sherlock is not a thinking machine. He's an emotional, vulnerable man. The great heart, if you will. They find the DVD from Mary and we finally get to see the full message. And again, the show presents this idea that Sherlock and John need Mary in order to work. Save John Watson. But I do think you're going to need a little bit of help with that because you're not exactly good with people. So here's a few things you need to know about the man we both love. The man we both love? Assuming that's never going to lead anywhere. Bob. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Culverton sneaks into Sherlock's room and reveals that the hospital has a series of secret passages. I built this whole way. Kept firing the architect and build this another one. New choir. Oh, it all fitted together around a castle, but done right. Okay, I haven't done this in a while. I'm going to put a pin in that, of all things. We will come back to it in the next video. By the way, that thing the show had about queer coding villains, yeah, that hasn't gone away. You've been ages waking up. I watched you. It's quite lovely in its way. Lovely. Maintain eye contact. Now listen, I love a good homoerotic hero villain moment as much as the next gal. Really, I do. If you've read From a Drop of Water, you know I myself played into that dynamic. But that was in the context of Sherlock being a queer story overall. In this strictly surface level, not reading Culverton as a dark John mirror context, this feels unnecessary. Culverton nearly succeeds in killing Sherlock, but John barges in in the nick of time and pulls Culverton away. Culverton is under the impression that he can still get free. He found three recording devices after all, but Sherlock reveals there was a fourth hidden in John's cane. Two weeks ago? Three. I'm not predictable. No, I'm just a cock. So Culverton is arrested and finds once he's started confessing, he can't stop. It's funny. I never realized confessing would be so enjoyable. Should have done it sooner. Okay, not gonna read anything into that whatsoever. We're just going to move on to the emotional climax of the episode. Sherlock and John back in Baker Street at last. The two chat a bit, but John wants to leave as soon as the conversation gets even slightly personal. I thought we were just hanging out. Molly will be here in 20 minutes. Sherlock offers to let John go, and he nearly does, despite Ghost Mary shouting at him over it. Christ, John, stay, talk. Sorry, it's just, um, you know, Rosie. Yes, of course, Rosie. Again, I have to ask, who has been watching this baby? Adding a baby to a Holmes adaptation makes no sense. It's a logistical nightmare unless you ignore it entirely, which is kind of what they do, so. Pop. John goes to leave and Sherlock mentions Culverton's obsessive need to confess. Not that that matters, apparently he can't stop confessing. If I'm not meant to read into that, I would love it if the reminders stopped. Thanks. But John is still leaving. Until. Oh, great. <laughs> so I've already mentioned that after a scandal in Belgravia, every conversation about Sherlock's romantic interests brings up Irene. We're still doing that, I guess. John clearly still thinks Sherlock is in love with Irene. Oh, the posh boy loves the dominatrix. He's never knowingly under cliched, is he? But he doesn't address it directly at first. Happy birthday. Thank you, John. That's very kind of you. Remember what I said about the timeline of series four being unclear? This is a prime example. Sherlock's birthday is January the 6th. Tarmac Hell was on New Year's Day. So either an entire year has passed since this series started, or this scene is taking place five days after the tarmac. And oddly enough, I'm sticking a pin in that thought too. John asks about Irene and Sherlock says nothing ever happens between them. At which point John loses his cool. She's out there, she likes you and she's alive. And do you have the first idea how lucky you are? Okay, so John is missing Mary, right? Yes, she's a lunatic, she's a criminal, she's insanely dangerous, trust you to fall for a sociopath. Oh, married an assassin. Uh, is anyone else getting flashbacks to... You're abnormally attracted 
to dangerous situations and people. But she wasn't supposed to be like that. Why is she like that? John insists that Sherlock texts Irene back. Sherlock tries to say he doesn't want to, giving his usual line about romance, but this time, John pushes back. As I think I have explained to you many times before, romantic entanglement, while fulfilling for other people, would complete you as a human being. And there it is, the last remaining bit of Sherlock's question. He has a heart, and he needs romance. With who? Well, I guess the answer is Irene after all. I mean, she's the only one who would push Sherlock to be a better man, which is John's criteria for a life partner, because apparently John was only a good man to live up to Mary's expectations. She taught me to be the man she already thought I was. Get yourself a piece of that. Which is just such a blatant contradiction. John was a good man long before he met Mary. Sherlock tries to push back on this idea too, but John reveals his affair. Forgive me, but you are doing yourself a disservice. I have no many people in this world but made few friends and I can safely say I cheated on her. He specifies that they only ever texted but then says but I wanted more and you know something I still do. So it's not just Sherlock romantically unfulfilled it's John too he wanted more, he still does. There's something he wasn't getting with Mary. Which sounds a lot like where we left things in series three, doesn't it? And back then, it seemed like there was one clear alternative, one that would leave both Sherlock and John fulfilled romantically. Of course, this is immediately followed up by John saying all he wants in life is to be the man Mary thought he was. Who you thought I was is the man who I want to be. And at this point, he breaks down. Sherlock comforts him, which in this scene is sweet, but in the context of the episode is less so. I can't quite look away from Sherlock's injured eye. A bit later, they decide to meet Molly for cake, so at least John is hanging out with Sherlock again, and Sherlock tries to make John feel better about his affair by saying he also texts the woman. And we end the scene with the idea that both of them are fallible. It's not a pleasant thought, John, but I have this terrible feeling from time to time that we might all just be human. Even you? No. Even you. Which, yeah, okay, but in ways that have not been previously foreshadowed, so again, it rings a bit hollow. As they leave, Sherlock puts on his hat, insisting that he wears it. Seriously? I'm Sherlock Holmes, I wear the damn hat. Isn't that right, Mary? When I said series four ramps up the conflicting information, this is a prime example of what I meant. It's more opaque than ever what you're actually meant to be getting out of any of this. Like if I were reading into it, which I'm not, I'd see the statement that Sherlock is wearing the hat because that's what Mary would want as very telling. Like this is part of the satire. Of course Sherlock wears the hat. That's who he is. But I'm not doing that right now, so bop for inconsistency. The episode ends with John back in therapy, doing better than ever. Rosie's great. Beautiful, perfect, unprecedented in the history of children. No kidding, she never needs anything. His therapist asks about Sherlock, who is also doing well. I swear my wife is channeling Satan. Yes, boring, go away. And Mycroft, who is having conversations about drink code, obviously. Maybe you'd like a drink sometime. Of what? Up to you. <sighs> Bob. Oh, but what about the other one? I mean, the other one. Which other one? You know. The secret one. And here we go, the television history big reveal. Because it turns out that the faith that Sherlock had met, and John's therapist, and the woman on the bus John was having a text affair with, are all the same person! You're nicer. You have such nice eyes. I just be a therapist talking about you all the time. And Sherlock had the clues he needed all along. Okay, I, not to get too bogged down in the details, but Eurus hacked all the TVs? Is, is that what we're saying? And also broke out of prison to flirt with her brother's best friend for... Actually, how did that accomplish anything? I mean, it's definitely a power move, flirting more successfully with the man your brother is in love with. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Sherlock is in love with Iron Adler. Never mind. This makes no sense. Bop. <laughs> and then, the biggest reveal of all. Didn't it ever occur to you not even once that Sherlock's secret brother might just be Sherlock's secret sister? <gasps> a sister? That changes everything! Seriously though, what difference does this make? What about any of this plot would change if Eurus was a man? I mean, I guess apart from the flirting with John thing, that definitely would have been better with Sharonford. But this twist is played so seriously when one, the secret sibling plot isn't that great to begin with, and it seemed like the show knew that. Maybe it was a secret twin. A 
awesome. A secret twin. So, pop. <laughs> and two, revealing a main character's brother was actually a sister for no reason. I regret to inform you, Stephen, you've already done that one once. Spot on, and I didn't expect to be right about everything. Harry's short for Harriet. Harry's your sister. But what exactly am I supposed to be doing here? Sister? No, seriously, what am I doing here? It's always something. Pop. <laughs> and the thing is, both writers have actually stated in interviews that this twist isn't very clever. And the, the madness that we thought would never sustain of saying, of hinting that Charlotte's got a brother, and then pulling, frankly, in the circumstances, the only twist you can, <laughs> which you didn't get, come on, uh, is, the, is actually Sherlock's sister. Our big twist, which we got away with, was it wasn't a brother, it was a sister. It's not that clever. But it's played up so much. And then Eurus descends into her characteristic madness. He's making a funny face. I think I'll put a hole in it. So John got shot and is now dead, paying off on that foreshadowing from the beginning of the episode. It was nice knowing him, and that's it. That's the end of BBC Sherlock. It was a sad place to end things, but I guess killing John does kind of symbolize what they did to his character in those two episodes. I should probably offer some closing thoughts on the series. Well, to start, what? What do you mean there's a third one? <laughs> no, 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 that doesn't matter. We don't have to talk about it. Hello, my name's Jim Moriarty. Welcome. Final problem. This is, this may be the final problem, but uh, if it is, all we can say is a huge thank you to the incredible team who've made Sherlock what it is today. And as Pierce says, an absolute phenomenon which has taken us all by surprise. It's been an amazing roller coaster, but nothing like the Pepsi Max you were about to go on. And above all, you know those complaints about it being a bit too James Bondy and action-y? <laughs> Not till tonight. If I had to describe the final problem in one word, that word would be transgressive. The word was, we kept saying transgressive. Yeah. Everything should be like we're breaking rules. From the beginning, Steve and I conceived this script as being full of transgressions. Oh heavens, they're, good. they're showing that, they're revealing that, they're doing that. Oh my god, there's no way back. On purpose. That, apparently, is what the writers meant when they said that this episode was insane wish fulfillment. Stephen Moffat has said that this episode is now the bit of writing in his entire career that he is most proud of. And it's transgressive and James Bondy on purpose. What conclusions might one draw about that? In this particular video, None whatsoever. There's plenty that's strange in the final problem, but it's all best experienced in context. In spite of the catastrophic aftermath this episode had, I actually find it the easiest of the three to have a fun time with now, mainly because of that transgressive nature. If you're approaching this episode in the right headspace, it's absolutely hilarious, <laughs> if only because of the massive gulf between what we expected and what we got. It's kind of like the sign of three in reverse in that way. After the credits, we find Mycroft watching some sort of noir film, but the footage is corrupted by Eurus. Yeah, not off to a great start on my end here. Mycroft rushes out of the room and we get the beautiful reveal of his umbrella sword, paintings that look like philosopher John Locke crying blood, and a literal clown. An actual clown. This is really happening. Just when you think it can't get any better, the umbrella sword is also a gun. <laughs> I should probably be throwing out bops left, right, and center, but I'm having a great time. <laughs> it's quickly revealed that the entire thing was set up by Sherlock, who apparently just wears the deerstalker around now, just fully embracing the persona, I guess, in order to get information about Eurus. And look, John isn't dead after all. <laughs> She's out. That's not possible. It's more than possible. She was John's therapist. Shot me during a session. Only with a tranquilizer. That looked nothing like a tranquilizer, but okay, Bob. <laughs> they go to leave and Mycroft asks why Sherlock would put him through that. Why would he do that to me? That was insane. Uh, yes, well, someone convinced him that you wouldn't tell the truth unless you were actually wetting yourself. Someone. Probably me. Is there a way to sick a clown on the writers of BBC Sherlock, just hypothetically speaking? Okay, no, yeah. <laughs> God, I'm losing to the final problem. Again. <laughs> Mycroft goes to Baker Street the next day and they insist on him sitting in the client chair. Sherlock and John have a bit of their old banter back in this scene, so small victories. And after a bit of Mycroft hedging about the nature of truth. You're gonna tell the truth, Mycroft, pure and simple. 
Who was it said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple? We finally get Eurus's backstory. Eurus is younger than Sherlock and is so off the charts superhuman smart that she literally cannot feel pain. And we learn that despite what series three led you to believe, the Holmes family was well off after all. Originally, they owned Musgrave Hall. Where there was always honey for tea, and Sherlock played among the funny gravestones. Funny how? They weren't real. The dates were all wrong. An architectural joke which fascinated Sherlock. Yeah, Mark, I've been noticing that about the dates. Thanks for drawing attention to it. Bop. <laughs> Eurus apparently did something to Redbeard, which is why Mycroft would use it as a trigger word to see if Sherlock was remembering what had happened. She started referring to Redbeard as drowned, and this is what shaped Sherlock into who he is. Sherlock was traumatized, as he was in the early days, an emotional child. But after that, he was different. You know what? <sighs> Close enough, I guess. It was clear there was some trauma shaping him. I guess we'll work with this. <laughs> John Redley points out that they wouldn't send a child to prison for killing a dog. Hint, hint. And Mycroft agrees, but blames it on the fact that she set Musgrave Hall on fire soon after. Allegedly, she set a second fire in prison that killed her, but that was a lie. It is also a kindness. This is the story I told our parents to spare them further pain and to account for the absence of an identifiable body. Oh, more references to unrecovered bodies. Lovely. Bop. Eurus is in a prison named Sharonford, allegedly under maximum security. Just as Mycroft is saying this though, a singing drone crashes through the window. This is so ridiculous, I kind of love it. And what is the bomb called? I've authorized the purchase of quite a number of these. Colloquially, it is known as the patient's grenade. Oh, cool. That doesn't bring to mind any bombs that we're all still waiting to go off, does it? They make a plan of escape. Sherlock mentions John's daughter, because he has one of those, remember? It's easy to forget. The show often does. And Mycroft says John won't be able to call her because it might trigger the bomb. His response? Oscar Wilde. What? He said. The truth is really pure and never simple. Forget about my daughter, let's talk about iconic queer writers of the Victorian era, am I right? I can't even bop this, it's too good. Me and the big bopper are just vibin'. I know what I can use it for, this explosion. <laughs> Okay, so they should be dead, right? There is no way they survived that. Oh, but Mark has an answer. And this amazing stunt as uh, John and Sherlock uh, pitch themselves through the window onto the awning of speedies. Boop, and they're fine. Boop, and they're fine. They completely jumped over the. <sighs> Bop. <laughs> we cut to some sailors whose radio starts repeating Sharonford over and over. And the older man says to forget about it. Sharonford? Forget you ever heard it. Sometimes when we're out in these waters, we get that message. Forget about me. Okay, I have to mention that Sharonford Holmes was originally going to be Sherlock's name. It was going to be the adventures of Sharonford Holmes and Ormond Sacker. So the writers took Sherlock's original identity and turned it into a prison. Th that's not analysis. Those are just facts. The sailors hear a loud noise outside and they find Sherlock and John, who points his gun at them, and Sherlock and John steal the boat. My name's Sherlock Holmes. The detective the pirate. I mean, I'm all for piracy, I guess, but John is randomly pointing his gun at civilians? It gets bop. We also learn at this point that Mycroft wasn't so lucky in the explosion. He's not conscious. He's severely injured. No one is even confident he's going to pull through. Except we quickly learn that's a lie. So Mycroft, who is coincidentally played by Mark, one of the authors, is making it look like he's dying, but he really has a plan? I didn't actually say anything. I'm not gonna bop myself when I didn't say anything. <laughs> Mark's, Mycroft's plan involves a lot of silliness. This is insane. This is unnecessary. No, your security is compromised and we don't know who to trust. And that justifies dressing up. Yes, it does. He is really insistent that Yura stay secure. In short, if I find any indication my sister has left this island at any time, I swear to you, you will not. Which we are not going to speculate about at all. Instead, let's cut over to Sherlock, who has snuck in downstairs to meet Yuris. She's playing the violin. She doesn't stop playing, sometimes for weeks. Beautiful. Kills you in the end. Aye, still beautiful though. This is just as much of a minefield. Uh, nope. No speculating. Back to John and Mycroft watching footage of Eurus, who is so extremely smart that she's outgrown morality. The good isn't really good. The evil isn't really wrong. The bottoms aren't really pretty. You are a prisoner of your own meat. Why aren't you? 
I'm too clever. She sounds like a sticker you'd buy at Hot Topic. Is that what happens when you're a genius? <laughs> Downstairs, Sherlock and Yuris talk about her music. What do you think? Beautiful. You're not looking at it. I meant your playing. Oh, the music. I never know if it's beautiful or not, only if it's right. Yuris asks Sherlock to examine the violin, which turns out to be a Stradivarius, which Yuris offers to him. A Stradivarius? It's a gift. Who from? Me. Why does that remind me of... Here, take it. Madame says it is yours. My fees as a detective are not exactly trifling, but a Stradivarius, you're not serious. I am not. But Madame is. Okay, nope, nope, not doing it. <laughs> Especially not going to talk about them having a conversation about their sexual histories and Yuris revealing that she's maybe queer. Oh, have you had sex? I've had sex. Oh. One of the nurses got careless, I liked it. Messy though, people are so breakable. I take it he didn't consent. He? She? Afraid I didn't notice in the heat of the moment. Oh good, another queer villain. Pop. <laughs> Back upstairs, the governor reveals that Yuris is so incredibly clever that she can reprogram anyone she talks to. She seems to be trying to do the same to Sherlock. She talks him into approaching the glass and talks about her fond childhood memories of making him laugh. Turns out I got it wrong. Apparently he was screaming. Why was I screaming? Red Then we get this line. Oh, Sherlock, you know nothing. Touch the glass and I'll tell you the truth. Can you please stop talking about glass? Like. Sharonford is literally a prison made of glass. I hate this. Bop. <laughs> Upstairs, John works out that the governor was the one doing the interview in the footage they've been watching, and so realizes just how Yuris got out. She was in control all along. But it's too late. They're already trapped. Downstairs, well, I'm just gonna let this one play so as to not get myself in trouble. You think it's a trick? You look so unsure. You're not used to being unsure, are you? The man who sees through everything is exactly the man who doesn't notice. When there's nothing to see through. I have been waiting for this moment for so long. I don't especially care that Sherlock doesn't notice the glass isn't there. That's in character. He gets unobservant when he's emotional. I loathe <laughs> that this is the third time the show has pulled this same twist. That Sherlock's greatest weakness is always that he wants things to make sense and be clever. And this is worse than Magnuson. Worse even than the reveal that Moriarty's code wasn't real. Although in hindsight, that was pretty bad too. But this, after the brides and their clever use of glass, this felt pointed. And this was the moment when my brain broke. The glass may be elephant brand and shockproof, but I am not. So, <sighs> and we're fine. <laughs> Spoilers, for reasons that will come up in the last video, I'm not actually mad about this scene anymore. I just had it built up for so long, it needed at least a gentle bop. Yuris lets go of Sherlock initially, but then beats him. <laughs> No, no. Stop me in a minute. Upstairs, John tries to make a break for it, and hears Moriarty's voice spouting out every bad guy cliche known to man. Big red bouncy Dr. Watson! Wiglands attacking lower decks! Also cowboys and black hats! Darth Vader! Miss me! Miss me! Yeah, John, me too. Now, if you were anything like me, you were looking forward to seeing Moriarty's big plan all finally come together in the final problem. I mean, what else could they do after all those references in Reichenbach? It just fits so perfectly. <sighs> I want to break free. <laughs> the audacity to play this song and the verse with those specific lyrics in this episode. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. They don't pay attention to lyrics for songs, do they? I hate it. Bop. <laughs> but more good news in case anyone was worried, Moriarty is still extremely gay. You like my voice? This one's got more stamina, but he's less caring in the afterglow. Good for him. He then talks about smelling insane criminality, but in total fairness, this whistle signal is actually a bit cool. Uh. Moriarty arrives at his destination and look everybody, it's M Theory. <laughs>
there they are, plotting way together five years ago. Speaking of which, remember that bit about all the dates being wrong? I don't want to bore you with a bunch of math, but there are, depending on what they mean by five years, and depending on whether a year passes between his last vow and the end of The Lying Detective, three possible Christmas days this scene could take place. If it's five years, plus a few months, and the six Thatchers and The Lying Detective take up literally five days, this scene takes place a month before Sherlock and John meet, which in some ways seems like what they're suggesting happened, because they'll later imply that the great game happened after this. But on a surface read, I'm pretty sure that those two episodes took more than five days, so that can't be it. Two of the mathematical outcomes lead to this being the Christmas shown in A Scandal in Mulgravia, meaning that just before this scene, Mycroft was introducing Moriarty to Eurus. Maybe, but it kind of ruins the great game bit. And also, there's still a remaining plot hole. The most hilarious option here is that if a year passes over the course of series four, and if we go back five calendar years from 2016 to 2011, I regret to inform you that this scene takes place after the Reichenbach fall. Seems impossible, right? Except this is the only option that makes sense of this question. So am I under arrest again? You remain a person of interest, but until you commit a verifiable crime, you are, I regret, at liberty. Because to our knowledge, Moriarty was only arrested by Mycroft in Hounds, after the other two options take place. So Moriarty survived! <laughs> Which of these is actually the correct answer? All of them, none of them. There's no winning this game just five. Mycroft reveals that in exchange for use of Eurus's evil genius, she requires favors. Her request this time? Five minutes unsupervised with Moriarty. With me? She has noted your interest in the activities of my little brother. This really is the silliest possible execution of M-theory. Like, it's such a letdown. Bop. Moriarty goes down to Eurus's cell and the two have evil mind sex through the glass. Redbeard. Okay, so Moriarty knew about Redbeard. This is where knowing when exactly this took place would be helpful, but all the options are wrong, so he's always known. He never knew. Don't worry about it. Back in the present, whenever that is, John wakes up to find that he, Sherlock, Mycroft, and the governor have all been locked in Eurus's cell. With the glass back in place, of course. They hear the girl on the plane we saw in the opening, and Moriarty's response, welcoming her, and all of us, to the final problem. The girl, on a flight of the dead, says her plane is going to crash. Mycroft is less than happy. I'm on a plane and it's going to crash. What is this? We can't do this. Do something up there. Someone there. Is this supposed to be a game? I don't know, Mark. Is it? <laughs> Yura speaks to them from the TV monitor, where she will remain for most of the episode, and informs them of their dilemma. If they want to save the girl, they have to play her games. The first task? Mycroft or John have to kill the governor or his wife in the purple shirt will die. Mycroft's response to this is laughably out of character. I will not kill. I will not have blood on my hands. I mean, maybe when it comes to killing someone himself, but Mycroft absolutely already has blood on his hands at his orders. And he has coldly watched both Moriarty and Sherlock being tortured. Mycroft is kind of the epitome of the ends justify the means philosophy. So I'm already not quite buying this. And also now that I'm thinking about it, he definitely tried to kill that clown earlier. So no, this does not check out. Bop. Sherlock turns to John instead, who takes the gun. He tries to reassure the governor, and himself that this is the right course of action, but ultimately he can't go through with it either. This I buy a bit more than Mycroft, at least. <laughs> the governor shoots himself in an attempt to save his wife, but Eurus kills her anyway. Eurus tells Sherlock to bring the gun with him and to move on to the next room. And of course, Moriarty chimes in as they go. Come on now, Choo-choo! Choo-choo! It's the moment you've all been waiting for that explosion yet to go off. I mean, everything had been building up to an emotional climax before series four, a moment of revelation. Here it is. <laughs> Time to play a new game. There are three suspects, all brothers, Nathan Garydeb, Alex Garydeb, and Howard Garydeb. It's the three Garydebs! And boy oh boy, do they know what you wanted from that moment and literally dangle it before your very eyes. I'm going to apply some context to your deductions. Honestly, in hindsight, I find this so funny that I'm not even mad. I do have to bop it though for the catharsis. 
Bop. <laughs> Sherlock works out that Alex Garadeb is guilty and condemns him to death. And Eurus drops the two innocent brothers into the sea before also killing Alex. They drowned the three Garadebs in deep waters. Awesome. <laughs> in the next room, they find an empty coffin. Eurus reconnects them with the little girl who mentions that the plane is approaching a city. Mycroft gets an idea. It has to crash in the sea. What about the girl? Well, obviously Dr. Watson, she's the one who's going to crash it. No, we could help her land it. And if we fail, she crashes into a city. How many will die then? How are we gonna get her to do that? I'm afraid we're gonna have to give her hope. You know, I was just going to play that to point out the contradiction between Mycroft willingly sacrificing a little girl and all the people on the plane if they're still alive for the lives of the many, something Mycroft would absolutely do in contrast to him refusing to kill the governor. And now that I have, bop. But uh, those are some things that came out of Mark's mouth just then. Let's put a pin in that. <laughs> the first part of this puzzle is to work out who the coffin is for. Mycroft finds the lid, which has the words, I love you written on them. Pay attention to the framing here and who just happens to appear over Sherlock's shoulder. So who loves you? I'm assuming it's not a long list. John's guess? I mean, that. Don't be ridiculous, look at the coffin. I mean, coffin aside, I thought you guys were sexting now. It's not that ridiculous. Ah, but no, who really loves Sherlock? Molly Hooper, of course. Eurus reveals that there's a bomb in Molly's house, and in order to save her, Sherlock needs to get her to say the words, I love you. You might remember that before series four came out, one of the trailers included footage of Sherlock saying, I love you. Tell them your darkest secret. I love you. People obviously got excited about that, and during that infamous 2016 Tumblr Q&A, multiple people asked about it. One of them specifically asking if Sherlock was saying I love you to John. Mark's response? John is clearly standing behind him in the trailer, so unless he's talking to a mirror for some very bizarre reason, I should think not. Talking to a mirror? Would that ever happen on this show? I asked you to burn this scene into your memory. It's just that that's what John says he does, so if I'm being John. Molly being a John stand-in, wearing that rainbow sweater. This is why. Who does Sherlock love? Well, my friends, cherchez les miroirs. I can't say that to you. Of course you can, why can't you? You know why. It's always been true. If it's true, just say it anyway. <sighs> you bastard. Unless he was talking to a mirror, for some very bizarre reason. Probably I should bot myself for pointing this out, but she is literally wearing the Being John sweater, so I feel like this is the show's fault. I'm gonna bop them instead. Bop. It works. Molly says I love you. Of course, Yuris then reveals that there never was any explosion tied to a love confession. I'll do be sensible. There were no explosives in a little house. Why would I be so clumsy? Great. She made it up just to mess with them. Even better. Sherlock kind of loses it. No. <laughs> Me too, Sherlock, but he bopped that coffin enough for the both of us. Now the fourth trial. This, by far, like by miles, is the best scene of the episode and I would say this entire series. Everyone has been weird and out of character for about four hours now, but in this one scene, they're back. That scene? Eurus forces Sherlock to choose between killing Mycroft or John. Mycroft instantly begins insisting that Sherlock kill John, insulting him when he doesn't immediately comply. Look at him, what is he? Nothing more than a distraction, a little scrap of ordinariness for you to impress, to dazzle with your cleverness. Which is already a fascinating dynamic, and it becomes even more so when it's revealed that Mycroft is doing this on purpose, so that Sherlock will choose him. Nor everything he just said, he's being kind. He's trying to make it easy for me to kill him. But even knowing that, Sherlock's mind is made up. John tries to put a stop to it, but Mycroft reveals his greatest mistake, that he's the reason they're in this situation. It's only right that he dies now. He keeps on a brave face. Well, I suppose there is a heart somewhere inside me. I don't imagine it's much of a target, but why don't we try for that? It's almost disorienting how well-written and in character this scene is. So they didn't forget how to write like this, they just aren't. And the fact that the only scene written with this level of quality is the one where the character played by the writer insists on killing John in a series that has ruined his character, but it's only a ploy. He wants to be the one to die because he knows the entire thing is his fault. Catches my notice, we'll say. Yeah, earns that. Unfortunately, the good writing does not last long. Sherlock is not willing to kill either of them and turns the gun on himself, threatening to pull the trigger. With John and Mycroft just 
blandly watching on without reacting much. Yuris panics and knocks everyone out. When Sherlock wakes again, he's in a new cell covered in pictures of himself as a child. The girl on the phone says he's kept her waiting for a long time. The plane is starting to descend now and Sherlock tries to keep the girl calm. John, also on the phone now, somehow, reveals he's at the bottom of a well with small bones. Sherlock assumes they're redbeards. He quickly realizes that the room he's in isn't really a cell and finds himself back at Musgrave Hall. Eurus is seen on one last TV screen inside and invites Sherlock to solve the Musgrave ritual. It's time to solve the Musgrave ritual. Your very first case. And the final problem. <gasps> Water starts filling the well that John is trapped in, and Sherlock gets desperate. This entire episode, Eurus has talked about applying emotional context to the case, and here she does it one last time. You are upset, so you told yourself a better story, but we never had a dog. Yes, that is where I got the title of the retrospective from. I'll explain why I picked it in the last video. Here, Sherlock finally remembers Victor Trevor, and Eurus in her narration does her very best to ruin specifically my two favorite scenes, apart from the post credits of The Abominable Bride, by implying that they were actually about this Victor Trevor reveal the entire time. Victor, you water Sherlock all your life. I guess part of the implication is that he solved the Carl Powers case because it reminded him of Victor, maybe? They could state that a bit more clearly if that's what they're going for. And I will acknowledge that Redbeard did come up in tab. Nothing made me. I made me Redbeard but not in the waterfall scene. The thing that was interesting about both of those scenes originally had less to do with the water and more to do with- I will burn the horse out of you. I've been reliably informed that I don't have one. But we both know that's not quite true. It's always just you and me! <laughs> it was my turn. Right, sir. Yeah, that. The blatant statements of thematic intent. This is a blatant rewrite of two excellent scenes and makes them both much worse, so... Bob! <laughs> Eurus reveals she killed Victor out of envy. Sherlock had a companion, but she had no one. I had no one. And that's the clue Sherlock needed. He works out the song from the gravestones, mostly ignoring John as he slowly drowns, and realizes that there is no girl on a plane. Not really. It's only Eurus. How did she make herself sound like a little girl and imitate all the plane noises from this room? Don't worry about it. Bob! <laughs> You're playing with me, Sherlock. You're playing the game. The game, yes, I get it now. Did you have to use the phrase the game right now? Your mind has created the perfect metaphor. You're high above us all alone in the sky and you understand everything except how to land. Now, I'm just an idiot. I'm on the ground. I can bring you home. Can you? Yura says it's too late. Sherlock says it's not. This time, things can be different. It just went the wrong way last time, that's all. This time, get it right. Help me save John Watson. And she does. John's feet were previously chained to the bottom of the well, but suddenly that doesn't matter and they just pull him out. John says even though Sherlock can't actually take Yuris home, he gave her what she really needed. Well, you gave her what she was looking for. Context. And this, of course, is what finally makes Sherlock a good man. Well, he's a great man, sir. No, he's better than that. He's a good one. Yeah, no, Bob. <laughs> Mycroft is fine, Eurus had just locked him in her old glass cell, and he finally confesses the truth to his parents. They are less than thrilled. I'm not asking how you did it, idiot boy. I'm asking how could you? He did his best. Then he's very limited. Oh boy, not gonna disagree with that. <laughs> Eurus refuses to speak, but Sherlock visits her all the same, playing his violin for her, and eventually she plays back. John, meanwhile, gets another DVD message from Mary, and I have to ask, who did she arrange it with to send these? Are there more? Will there be more DVD messages every few months forever now? Bop! <laughs> and in this final message, Mary narrates that she, and only she, knows the true Sherlock and John. Again, she knows what they might become without her there to guide them, and then bafflingly says this. Will you listen to me? Who you really are, it doesn't matter. It's all about the legend, the stories, the adventures. 
which in addition to being massively upsetting for an audience of young queer people to hear, especially when they were hoping that this story would finally reveal the true story of two famous queer characters, is just blatantly the opposite of the point of the show. Even this episode, taken at a purely surface level, is showing an extreme version of what Sherlock might be in Eurus. Completely cold, completely detached. To show that's not who Sherlock is, and he's a better, stronger man for that. Again, he has a great heart. But that all goes out the window in this final montage. BBC Sherlock ends on the idea that the legend of Holmes and Watson matters more than the men. That they will always remain Mary Watson's Baker Street boys. But hey, they raise a kid together in the background, so I guess in the end, love conquers all. There are two men sitting arguing in a scruffy flat. Like they've always been there, and they always will. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. If that's the first time you've revisited these episodes since they aired, congratulations! You got through series four in one piece. Hopefully it wasn't as bad as you were afraid it might be. Not the plot, that was pretty silly. I mean the experience of watching it again. With the way I've presented this, I think you're probably left with more questions than answers at this stage. And that's partially by design. I've planted a lot of ideas that I plan to come back to in the final video. But right now, on this surface layer, we're looking at a show that completely unraveled by the end. Having now seen series four again, you might be wondering why I am still so sure that the queer subtext was there intentionally when it's all but absent in series four, or why I still consider the possibility that there's a point to this narrative when this series makes a very compelling case that it doesn't have one and never did. So here's the thing. This retrospective was initially going to be very different when I first started planning it, back when it probably actually could fit into one video, when I had accepted that there were hints of the story I loved in BBC Sherlock, but they probably were not there on purpose. The retrospective was going to touch on the more undeniable moments of subtext, mostly to say, hey, I can see how we got there, but I think looking back on it, they didn't mean this the way we hoped that they did. I wasn't going to bring up M-theory or a discussion of a possible thematic message at all, because I felt pretty sure that if these writers did have a goal, there wasn't any way to know it. And then, back in November, I had to scrap my entire script and start from the ground up. Everything I thought I knew about this show looking back on it had gone out the window. What caused that? I watched BBC Dracula for the first time. If you haven't heard of it, BBC Dracula was a show created and co-written by Mark Gatiss and Stephen Moffat, consisting of three 90-minute episodes released in January of 2020. And seeing it completely changed how I think about these writers and their work. And it's not just me. I have personally seen this happen to quite a few other people on various points of the convinced TJLC is going to happen to convinced TJLC is not going to happen spectrum. Why? <laughs> The next video will be answering that question in great detail, but the gist is that having Dracula as another example of how Mark and Stephen adapt a Victorian story, a story that is commonly read through a queer lens, reveals a lot about their interests, what they enjoy in their storytelling, and even why they adapt these stories to begin with. Going back to my plain metaphor at the end of the last video, and you might have a better idea of why I picked that as a metaphor now, we are currently remaining at cruising altitude. I will offer you another landing before we discuss series four through a TJLC lens, but not yet. To sell you on coming back to a video about a show you've probably never seen, I'm going to cover the first scene of Dracula now and hope it gets you hooked the same way it hooked me, because this is the moment I knew I had things wrong. And I'm going to try to recreate that experience for you. When I initially returned to Tumblr, people instantly began recommending that I watch Dracula. At first, I was sure I didn't have the time and also didn't particularly want to watch another Moftis adaptation. I knew three things about the show going in. People said it was like Sherlock, which I will admit, I discounted because of what had happened immediately after series four, a vague description of the final scene which I read when the show came out, which even then caused me to raise my eyebrows a bit at the potential meta implications, even back when I was convinced they didn't do meta implications, and last but not least, that Stephen Moffat had gone on the record denying that Dracula in the show was bisexual. He's bi-homicidal, it's not the same thing. He's killing them, not dating them. He's not actually having sex with anyone, he's drinking their blood. You might need to delete your Tinder if that's what you think. Dracula has always fed off men and women. So, you know. <laughs> The usual. Eventually, I decided to try the first episode at least. I'm not sure what I was expecting. Probably some 
vague gay jokes. You know, maybe Sherlock series one level. I gathered my dog and a cup of tea and settled in to watch the first episode. And after one scene, I had to pause the show and take my dog and my tea on a very, very long walk to think about things before I could continue. You'll know why shortly. We begin the show with Jonathan Harker in a monastery. He clearly has something wrong with him. A nun named Sister Agatha comes into the room. She reveals that she's been reading Jonathan's account of his time in Castle Dracula. It's the truth, all of it. And what a lot of truth there is. Jonathan sort of shrinks away from the sun initially, but eventually sits down. Another nun comes in to chaperone sister Agatha. Agatha bluntly asks why Jonathan isn't dead, and he says he ran away. She asks why he's not still running, and he says he believes he's safe where he is. This is a house of God. She's dismissive of that idea. Look to your own protection, Mr. Harker. God doesn't care. <sighs> Jonathan points out that this is an odd stance for a nun to take, and she says she made her vows a long time ago. At this point, a fly crawls into Jonathan's eye, and he's seemingly unbothered by it, which disturbs both nuns. Agatha regains her composure and mentions Jonathan's fiance Mina as a way to get more information about Jonathan's manuscript. Perhaps in time, you will let her read this account. If she wishes, yes. So out of kindness, you've omitted from your writings anything that would alarm or disturb her. Well, I didn't want to. Now, this is interesting, because the novel is set up in such a way that all of the accounts are written or recorded with painstaking care as the events unfold, giving the entire story almost a meticulous sense of credibility. Here, Mark and Stephen are instantly throwing doubt on that idea, casting Jonathan as an unreliable narrator. And what specifically might he have left out? So now you may tell me everything that occurred in the time you spent with the Count of this castle. Your dinners your conversations, your intimate moments. Wait, they don't really start this off by implying. Do you understand what I'm asking you? I think so. No, there's no way. They do not start the show off with. I'm asking Mr. Harker if you had sexual intercourse with Count Dracula. Welcome to Dracula. The first time I saw this moment, it was a revelation. It was the first time in five years that I felt sure that I had never been crazy. I hadn't made anything up. I wasn't missing anything. Mark and Steven just do this. They write blatantly queer stories and then lie about them in interviews. So the romance that I had convinced myself was there, but not really there in Sherlock, that had been real regardless of what they claimed or their motivations for having it there. When I said I feel convinced that they include queer subtext in their stories because it's part of what they like, whether that's because they enjoy playing with the implication or because they have a point to make about it, this is why. They wouldn't keep doing it otherwise. That was the biggest source of relief, that the queer elements of both stories were coming from an earnest place, even if it's not one I agree with. And that's only the beginning. Dracula is a very revealing piece of work from start to finish, especially if you're coming to it as a Sherlock fan, specifically a Sherlock fan who was reading the subtext. As we go through the show together, you'll find many familiar elements. Queer literary figures, raising questions about the truth behind the legend, specific callbacks to ideas and techniques and moments that you'll instantly recognize, and woven throughout it all, something that seems like a new kind of meta-commentary. One on Mark and Stephen's own work, the ways that they have gotten it wrong. Discussing Dracula is both the perfect bridge to analyzing series four and the best way to make peace with what we've gotten as it stands. And I hope that you'll join me for that conversation next time. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video. As silly as it might sound to an outsider, I know it probably wasn't an easy choice for some of you. I appreciate you trusting me to guide you through it, and I hope it helped. I'll see you again next time for BBC Dracula.